Uh, my name is Chris Eagle. Thanks for coming. Uh, and uh, clearly nothing better to do on a Sunday afternoon at DEF CON. But, uh, okay. I'm not good with microphones. I don't know if I can pick. Bam. Okay. Um, again, I'm Chris Eagle. And uh, this talk is titled Creating Genetic Mutations to Survive the Vulnerability Window. And there's zero scientific uh, knowledge in here. Better subtitle is Stupid Hex Editor Tricks or uh, Creating Nipples in the Gene Pool. I guess it was, uh, or just Nipples in the Pool was uh, suggested from the crowd. And, you know, you might like some of that better than this talk. Well, we'll see. Uh, so, again, Stupid Hex Editor Tricks. This is not deep, deep stuff, all right? Um, and anything I say has nothing to do with who I work for or who I know or no, no guilt by association stuff there. So the stuff I'm going to talk about is really born from ideas uh, developed out of playing CTF for the past couple years where your, your threat model is you have an application that has vulnerabilities and it needs to survive for three days. Okay, with some pretty serious people looking for holes in this thing. But uh, perhaps, well, we'll get to the more general use case uh, maybe. The idea, again, no source code available. Um, you have to run the service for whatever reason that might be. This, there are business cases like that. Uh, and in our case, the patch needs to survive less than three days. Okay? You, uh, in the real world, you may not know how long the, uh, the vendor will take to patch the thing. So um, we'll just go from there, three days. Uh, I'll use uh, x86 examples as I go through this stuff. Uh, I think uh, it could be easily adapted to other platforms. Uh, it's, it's pretty generic techniques. Again, there's, there's nothing really deep going on here. So uh, a while back, Dan Gear talked about uh, the problem with the software monoculture uh, in which um, a large uh, number of platforms all running essentially the same software um, uh, are, you know, provide for this, uh, the capability of mass propagations of worms and such. Um, and the idea is that uh, in order to mitigate this uh, sort of monoculture problem, you've got to uh, uh, address the similarity uh, in all the software some way, you know, short of getting everybody to migrate to uh, different operating systems and so on. Um, this is, again, one you know, novel approach perhaps or not to uh, go about that. So we talk about a couple things. The idea, of, uh, the notion of a vulnerability window, you can talk about it a lot of different ways. Um, but basically spans the, the time frame from the discovery of a vulnerability, uh, whether it's disclosed or not, uh, up through the time at which a patch becomes available. And then you could extend that through uh, the delay for lazy system administrators getting the patch applied. And, and that's sort of a different problem. Uh, two components, so you can break the window into two, or as I view it, you have discovery time to disclosure time, okay, which, you know, if nothing ever gets disclosed, that could be forever. But uh, so uh, your vulnerability in that window is a, a lot more difficult to pin down. Obviously, if you can spot the fact that you're vulnerable, then uh, the thing has become somewhat public. Uh, requires uh, cooperation of the discoverer in order to make this thing known. Uh, sometimes uh, difficult to get, uh, or it propagates wide enough that it eventually it leaks out uh, to someone who is uh, cooperative. And during this window, you have very little uh, defensive capability. If you run into a vulnerable application uh, and you know, it's accessible remotely or by whatever means, then you are probably vulnerable. Uh, it, it, obviously, the, the vulnerable application in its default configurations. Then you have uh, the time window from disclosure okay, to the availability of a patch. Okay, and that, that can last uh, differing amounts of time depending on the disclosure uh, model used by the discoverer. And uh, during this window, you might have defense uh, by mitigation. Uh, if you know how to mitigate the attacks, uh, you know, the, severe, the most severe would be uh, securing the service. Um, but uh, there may be other techniques, and that's sort of what I'm going to talk about. And uh, the idea here is that we want this window to be um, shorter than the time it takes to automate that vulnerability and turn it into, say, a worm. 
okay? Because of course, uh, then all hell breaks loose and that's, that's where the monoculture comes into play. But uh, if we can keep that short, then uh, maybe we can uh, survive through there. So in that window, what do we do? Okay, if we're waiting for the vendor supplied patch, you, uh, you don't have a whole lot of options. There might be uh, a patch offered up by the discoverer. We don't see this too often. Okay, often the, the, you know, in cooperative uh, disclosure, the discoverer will coordinate with the vendor and uh, details will be released uh, when the patch uh, becomes available. Um, alternatively, the discoverer will just throw this problem out there and offer you uh, no real means to fix it. Uh, and you're left to your own devices to understand the nature of the problem and secure the hole. Uh, alternatively, and we don't see this too often, but uh, we have seen a couple of interesting cases in the past year or so where independent researcher provides a patch, uh, not, not the person necessarily who discovered the hole, and they make this thing available. Uh, you have Ilfac uh, Gilfanov's uh, WMF patch that came out last year, widely touted by SANS as, as the way to fix that, that hole, and uh, I think EI came out recently with an uh, Internet Explorer patch uh, for uh, some client-side vulnerabilities there. They can be controversial because who do you trust? You know, what, what's, what's the software QA process that goes on these things? And uh, what, are the, what are all the interactions that they may cause with the uh, application that uh, they, they claim to patch? So th there, there's also some controversy that goes along with these things. So if we take, uh, well, you know, I don't want to turn anything into a disclosure debate, uh, unlikely to happen here today. But, uh, and, and personally, I don't care whether you disclose or not, that's up to you. I don't care if you coordinate with a vendor or not, that's up to you. Um, they're probably not paying for your time anyway. Uh, yeah, and I'm just kind of in the, the school that says, if you do choose to disclose, it'd be nice if you told people how to protect themselves. They okay, don't offer a patch necessarily, but tell you know, why, you know, not just, hey, here's my O-Day, but uh, maybe here's what you can do to prevent it. And you know, maybe that includes shutting down the service, but maybe there are some other things that you can get, you can do. And that's kind of where I fall on all that, and I don't think it's worth getting into. There's enough of that going on. Uh, so before I get any further, there have been a, a few patching talks uh, that have gone on uh, through Black Hat and DEF CON, I guess, and they've, they've been kind of interesting. They've talked about the new uh, Microsoft hot, patch, uh, hot patching features where with uh, certain compiler switches, you basically have built-in room uh, at the uh, beginning of every function to kind of hook in, divert the function call, and uh, uh, inject patches that way. Um, and that's, that's not what this is all about. This is what I'm talking about here is simple changes, relatively simple changes to a binary to alter its runtime characteristics, not necessarily its behavior, uh, sufficiently enough to foil automated exploitation attempts, okay? Sometimes doing this is a lot easier than fixing the problem behaviorally, which may require addition of a, you know, injection of an additional code to perform uh, any kind of boundary checking, error checking, whatever it might be that uh, you, you would like to do to fix the problem. Uncheck string copy. We need to add some kind of check uh, on the length of the buffer that's going to get copied and so on. And adding those checks takes space. Space is sometimes at a premium inside a binary, and creating that space, obviously without the source code to be able to recompile it, um, is probably uh, you know a sophistication uh, level above what I'm going to talk about here. Uh, and so finally, these things are basically security through obscurity. So I, again, I do not tout them as a way as a long-term fix. Obviously, you, you're interested in getting the problem patched at the behavioral level, not just at the uh, sort of characteristics level. So uh, with that, also, they uh, are not necessarily, in most cases, not unexploitable. They, they are just exploitable in a different way than the rest of the monoculture out there. So the point is, once a worm hits the streets, uh, if they, you know, let's say, are you know, very good and build the worm to sort of brute force their way through every machine they attack or just those that they're unsuccessful against, then perhaps uh, the worm will give you a try and just pass on by. Uh, so again, they remain uh, not a long-term solution. Uh, ultimately, the patch is what we're after. So uh, some assumptions, I guess, uh, that uh, auto automat automated exploits are generally built for specific target layouts. 
I mean, they may uh, understand a few different target layouts. So we got the sort of things that'll hit uh, Win 2K, Win XP, various service packs, and so on. But they tend to look for specific features on each of those, um, and or exploit common functionality across all of the platforms. So if you look different than your stock Win 2K service pack four box or whatever they're at these days, then maybe even uh, these things will not hit you. And that's that's the goal. Um, most automated attacks aren't smart enough to evolve. Okay, these things are out there looking for the low-hanging fruit, scanning for a target list, and then iteratively hitting, through, hitting each target on the list. And when they fail to propagate to a target, uh, they often just move on. Now, your dedicated, serious uh, attacker out there who's after you individually, specifically, uh, might realize that uh, their stock attack is not working against you and, and may t then take the time to try to brute force their way into your system, okay, and ultimately they may make your way through. Um, so this is, and this is not uh, probably the protection that is for you if that's your threat model. It's, again, patches are the best bet. Okay, so into binary patching, which is ultimately where we're going. Again, it's, it's really stupid hex editor tricks. Uh, so uh, it's not for everybody, it's uh, something of a black art. Um, you need to have some familiarity, at least with the assembly language level, maybe some binary auditing, uh, some executable file format layout issues, things like that to understand what your uh, opportunities are with any given binary. Is there room to add code? Um, how much room? Can I create room? Can I divert the, the flow of execution to some other location uh, where there is some room? And so on. And then what code needs to be moved to accommodate any behavioral checks that you would like to add. Um, and unfortunately, compilers are often concerned about the size, uh, size issues. Not, uh, not all the time, but often. And don't generally leave too much free space. You can find some. Um, sometimes uh, you can create some if you're uh, willing to dig into program headers and sort of spread things out. Uh, but as soon as you start messing with the virtual address layout of the binary, then uh, you're adding an additional level of complexity on top of all your changes. Um, and you know, it, ultimately, if we want to add some uh, new behavior and we need to use additional functions that uh, may not be included, like a safer version of string copy, with, which includes checks and so on, if that function was not imported by the original binary, then you have the additional task of, of adding the capability of the function to locate, uh, of the binary to locate that function and so on. So we have all these sort of cascading <laughs> problems. So. Some simple mutations that maybe we can uh, deal with. Uh, the ones that are easiest uh, involve uh, stack mutations, and uh, stack mutations simply alter the stack layout to something other than the stock stack layout. And we'll, I'll, I'll talk about uh, what that is. And again, they're the simplest to perform. There are you know, some, some simple heap mutations that you can do without having to add a whole lot of extra code or, or change too much. And the, the goal, again, is to just alter the heap layout so that it looks different than what the attacker expected, since some of these things require very specific knowledge of uh, where uh, overwrite code will land. Uh, format string uh, mutations, these are, again, harder and, and evolve more to changing the characteristics, so I don't spend a lot of time there. And then uninitialized stack variables in which we hope to sort of alter the stack layout to move the uninitialized variable again, and that's uh, kind of up with stack mutations on, in a different uh, sort of uh, vein. <coughs> so I'll start with stack mutations. And uh, the basic idea with stack mutations, a, a very simple idea, is to simply grab more stack space in the function prologue. A lot of functions start off with grabbing some local variable space. And you can see the code that does it there. If you uh, set up a stack frame and adjust uh, for your, sta your local variable storage, in this case, uh, the first prolog there grabs 34 byte hex bytes uh, on the stack for some local variables. Okay, and that's often done as a one byte constant. So that has some implications later on. But if you want more space, grab more space. Okay, subtract 80 hex bytes. And that, that builds you just, in this case, you know, 50 hex bytes or 80 bytes uh, of space to kind of rearrange the layout of the stack. Okay. In the second case, uh, they're grabbing a, a much larger chunk of stack space. In that case, uh, just over 1K worth of stack space. 
and that constant happens to be larger and so you can make a significantly larger adjustments in that case to grab a significantly larger amount of stack space and, and have uh, larger uh, variance in your rearrangement of things. In a sense this is uh, poor man's uh, address space randomization. Okay, when you start doing these kinds of things. Just because, again, your, your stack layouts, offsets, return addresses end up getting shifted around so that the stock exploits don't work. Once you grab that extra stack space, you need to sift through the code and just adjust pointers into the stack frame, which tend to be relative offsets from a frame pointer or, or the stack pointer itself. So in stack pointer based frames there, ESP based frames, then uh, in actuality, ESP based frames, there's no adjustment needed for local variables because everything just remains relative to ESP. It's just higher up in the stack space. Okay, and you've built a gap a buffer of sorts at the bottom of the stack that just is, remains unused. Okay, and of course, we have to also assume that we don't care too much about memory consumption okay, or, or not start grabbing too much uh, stack space uh, just for the hell of it. Uh, <coughs> the only thing that does need adjust be adjusting in the uh, ESP-based stack frames is the depth to the function arguments sitting under the return address, as mentioned there. So, you don't have to adjust any uh, references to local, local arguments because every, everything floats with the stack pointer, which is just higher up. And you have to dig deeper in uh, that stack frame to get to your function arguments. When you have a, ba a frame pointer based stack frame, like an EBP based stack frame, then you need to adjust all your local variable arguments because they're higher up in the stack. So we have to subtract a greater offset off of EBP. Uh, but there is no adjustment required for your function arguments. The first case is usually easier because there's typically more local variables declared than there are arguments. So there's fewer changes perhaps. So you know, here would be a simple example where you see a stack layout where they basically grab about uh, 1K of stack space up there and you see some variables declared in the stack including that uh, var 3F8 which is about a 1K uh, stack based buffer which is perhaps susceptible to a buffer overflow. And you can see that the declaration or the, the way they access that is uh, using a relative offset from EBP there in the last line of the text where that uh, equates to EBP minus 3F8. You can see the offsets over in the left margin. Um, and so that might be the default layout. Now if we can inject say 2K of code into that buffer, obviously we have a stack based buffer overflow. Uh, corrupting uh, EIP and uh, allowing perhaps remote code execution. So we can make a quick adjustment here and instead of uh, subtracting uh, 414 hex, we change one byte in the code, we are now subtracting 814 hex. So now our buffer in the stack is about 2K and everything just shifts up. Okay, it requires us, in this case, I shifted everything up in the stack, remain the relative, uh, remain the the, the relative di the relationships among all the stack variables. And from, for all intents and purposes, you can still treat the former var 3 F8, which is now var 7 F8, as a 1K buffer. It's just a 1K buffer that has about a 1K padding area beneath it. So if somebody was overflowing with something slightly over 1K, they don't reach EIP. Okay, it, it, it's that simple. And we have to go in and change that uh, subtraction operation where, where we adjust, where we allocate our locals. That's a one byte flip right there. And we go in and change any references, uh, EBP based references to all of the, the local arguments that are sitting up there in the stack. So we end up with EBP minus uh, 7F8 and that still reaches the start of the buffer. Okay, again, not terribly sophisticated stuff. Does it, does it remain vulnerable? Yes. Okay, is the stack layout the same as the rest of the monoculture? No. Okay, so again, maybe you survive that uh, vulnerability window just a little bit longer. Okay, an alternative would be to simply move the buffer entirely, okay, where we don't move any of the other uh, stack-based variables, and we, uh, in this, uh, we again grab all the extra space and just change the offset to that single variable, the stack-based buffer, which moves to the top of the local variable space, still a 1K or 1,016-byte buffer, if I did my math right. Uh, followed on the tail end by a bunch of local variables and another thousand bytes of padding. 
Okay, same sort of effect. Okay, uh, the slight, there's a side effect here that now in order to get to EIP, the attacker also has to write through a lot of other local variables. Okay, some of which, you know, hopefully none of which, you know, it, it's poor man's canaries. Okay, if you corrupt any of these variables, you may cause, or the function may error out in a variety of different ways, hopefully cleanly. Okay, and if we error out cleanly, perhaps we'll avoid any activation of the stack-based buffer overflow. Okay, so this, is, this gets in, or, you know, sort of a, a, a small demonstration of, of permutations of these variables. If you can rearrange your buffers, okay, move file descriptors or something like that below an overwritable buffer, Okay, then you start to inject, uh, uh, get perhaps some error <coughs> conditions that might crop up that prevents things from getting triggered as well. Okay, the variations on this theme are, again, sometimes uh, you rely on offsets into the stack. There, things are more sophisticated these days where we try to get addresses to things like a jump ESP okay, or jump to a known register. But when people do rely on known addresses in the stack, Okay, if we can change where things lie, where's your shellcode, for example? If you have to point at your shellcode for, for any reason, if we can just move the location of the shellcode, okay, then you're not going to hit it. Okay, even though you might trigger the overflow, you don't land in your shellcode. So simple ways to uh, move the shellcode around just involve grabbing more stack space from main on up. If main grabs more stack space than it needs, regardless of whether it has any stack-based buffers, then all the stack addresses for every local variable all allocated by functions called from main change. Okay, so it's, it's again, poor man's uh, stack randomization, I suppose, is the best way to put it. Oh, I went backwards, I guess. In or, uh, reordering local variables, I, I mentioned briefly that one, and just place additional locals between buffers and save return address, uh, and so on. Hey, heap mutations, there's less we can do here without getting into the behavioral modification of the program. Okay, the easy change is that uh, when, we, when a heap <coughs> overflow occurs in fixed size buffers. So what you're looking for here is when the object that is getting overflowed out of is a fixed size object in memory, okay, malloc with a fixed size constant, okay, change the constant, grab more space. Okay, these are more particular uh, to the layout of the memory, okay, because you have to have the right alignment for all your pointers to line up and the unlink operation and all that. So if we can, if, you, if your object is 40 bytes it gets overflowed out of, ask for 90, ask for 100. Okay, get a larger size chunk. And then there's, you build a little bit of padding on the backside and the attacker has a harder time finding that next frame or that next chunk in memory and lining up the pointers correctly. If the, chunk, if the size of the chunk is computed by some mathematical operation, then you have a little more difficulty okay, because you're going to have to influence the math there to try to grow that size out to grab more space than you need. Again, it, you know, we want to do these things where memory is not necessarily a premium. Okay, and grabbing more space can be done without uh, bringing the system to its knees. Okay, and so the idea here is, is we mutate to increase the amount of, si of space requested so that the overflow out of the uh, heat buffer uh, doesn't quite behave the way the attacker might want it to. Okay. Again, we're still not unexploitable. So you know, this is just silly. Uh, Hex edit, if, if you have a 16-byte object that's just a data buffer or something, you're copying of that, grab 64 bytes. Okay. The attacker doesn't know you did it unless they start brute, brute forcing things and they get their pointers to line up beyond there, then uh, hopefully they'll move on to the next target. Again, computed size mutations, if they're computing the size, a little more difficult because you have to influence the size of the argument to malloc, uh, which uh, you know, even if you just want to add an, an arithmetic operation, you may be, need as many as five bytes in there to do that. Nothing's wrong. Format string mutations, harder to do. Okay, if it's a format string vulnerability, you, what you want to do is substitute your own format string in there, okay, which often involves pushing an extra argument okay, to a format string that you can specify. And you can build format strings almost anywhere you want. Usually you can find space to do that. Uh, use any old string that you hardly ever use. Terminate things like copyright notices and just overwrite it with the format string. And then get your pointer to the format string pushed on the stack. Just point at that string that you edit in the binary virtually anywhere. Okay, and 
again, as long as you can create the space to do that, you can, you can craft format strings just anywhere in memory. Um, all right, so important point strings. Modify post return stack adjustment. Oh, yeah. If you've had any time, that's simple binary patching stuff. Anytime you try to push extra arguments, you know, when you have like C standard calling conventions, you're going to have to clean up after yourself. So don't, don't ever forget to do that. Okay. So the adjustment to me. Un uninitialized stack variables. Uh, Halvar spent some time talking about this over the past year or so. Um, you have this variable in the stack that doesn't get initialized by the function, and you know, the exploit, uh, exploitable condition is to make some function calls that grow the stack space through that variable, leaving a value that you can predict in the uninitialized variable and hope that it gets used uh, in, a, in a manner that's exploitable. So the idea here is move your variable. Permute the stack. Okay? If they, you, that way, the attacker, when they're trying to lay that one value into that memory location through some sequence of, of calls that grows and shrinks the stack, then they, their, their picture of your uninitialized variable, where they think it is, is different than where it actually ends up. So even though you still don't necessarily get to initialize the thing, it's not where the attacker thought it might be. So he doesn't get to initialize it with what he had hoped either. And he's got to spend some time perhaps brute forcing through memory to try to figure out that you've done this. Or again, hopefully, move on. Okay, you, you're, the idea here again is to hopefully not be the low hanging fruit. Okay, you're still fruit, you're just not hanging so low. Okay, going quick. Okay, so a couple simple demonstrations. I told you this is not a real technical talk, it's just some ideas thrown out there from CTF world. Uh, that's really light text. Can anybody, people read that or is that too light in the back? Too light? Uh, let me see if, if you don't mind if I edit my slides here on the fly. What's that? Kill the lights. Oh man, don't do that. Can't see my keyboard. No, that didn't work. Got like bigger too, sorry. Okay, is that better? Of course, it's darker too. So, um, okay. So, you know, here's a couple simple examples. Simple examples that, if the demonstrations go right, they'll work. And if not, then uh, sorry, I wasted an hour. Um, so, this is basically the area out of uh, SQL Server that was the, responsible for the SQL Slammer worm, and you can see <laughs> that. There, Microsoft is using the sprintf function call here, always you know, known to be a, a, a poor choice. And the idea is that if you can see the snippets of strings over there in the right margin, they are sandwiching some static text around, um, let's see, which is it? This uh, var, let me know which one. Okay, I don't have a pointer, unfortunately. Uh, the, the, right above the uh, sprintf call, there's a push eax. That is your buffer that's going to be the destination for all of this stuff. Okay, so if we can get a large value into that buffer represented by var 24c8 at the top, okay, all that text gets squeezed in between the, statics, the two static text snippets, with one being your format string and the other one that, that ends up on the tail. So. That's a problem because if you can see the math there, that destination buffer is what 84 hex or hex bytes above EBP and so on, which was what's that? 120, 132 bytes. Not a big buffer. Okay, so if we can fill up that top buffer with enough stuff, obviously we have a, a buffer overflow. Okay, and so the idea is, on the left you have the original stack layout with that uh, poor little buffer pwn me right there down at the bottom. And 
with some stack pointer manipulation. Uh, when, we when we allocate our local variables, we can uh, re reorient or relocate Pony up to the top of the stack and allocate it even some extra space. And now the, it's not where the attacker expects it to be. So here is the mutated code. Okay, I don't show you the stack adjustment up front, but the mutated code uh, basically places upon me the buffer all the way up at the top of the stack. Okay, and that's the basic idea. Now, not wanting to unleash slammer on myself, Metasploit has an exploit for this vulnerability. And here's a VMware image. We'll see if this will all work out for me. You can see I've got uh, SQL Server running on here. And we'll come out to the Metasploit console where I have, uh, and, and the, the box that we're looking at, as you can see, is, is unpatched. Okay, trust me. All right. And uh, I've got the Metasploit exploit all set up to go, um, which only takes seeing the keys to type. Thank you. Okay, so it's, it's all set up to go against that particular target, I hope, and so we run it, and Metasploit is always exciting <laughs> when it doesn't work. Run two Windows VMs on a doggy Dell laptop. Please work. Okay, there's the command prompt on the unpatched system. Thrilling, right? We can all do this in our sleep. So here's our other system, okay, which is running, which is a host named Patched, and it is also running SQL Server. And I'm going to go over here and grab my canned text. Yeah, thanks. Maybe, uh, I don't know if that'll be useful. Ooh, uh, okay. Um, for that host, because I don't like typing, and I can barely run Metasploit in front of the console. So we get out of this guy and paste in some text to, as you can see, change the host name over here, and unfortunately, we don't end up with a command prompt. Okay? And you have to trust me, that was patched. Okay? And we go back, and SQL Server even managed to survive the attack. Okay, that patch takes all of. Oh, I don't have. Do I? Oh, it's four bytes, as I mentioned here. Okay, it's a four byte patch, doesn't change any behavior. All it does is modify the stack layout, and now you look different than everybody else. And sometimes that's all we're trying to hope for. Okay, if you insist on running those vulnerable applications before the patches are out, then maybe this can help. Again, it's not unexploitable, okay, but it introduces a lot more complexity to the attacker because the layout of the stack is significantly different, and to get to this, the uh, saved e, uh, the return address down here, they still they have to go through a substantial number of other local arguments. Okay, 8K worth of stuff to blow through in this case because we've moved that buffer very far away from the stack and there's a whole lot of other local variables in there. So the, the complexity to the attacker is uh, increased significantly. Okay. Next. So that's, the, that's an idea where a simple change might help you survive against a worm propagation. Again, sophisticated attacker, he, he has a challenge of not knowing what your binary looks like anymore because he can't do a stock SQL Server install and grab the DLLs and understand the memory layout and so on. So at least he has that added complexity. It doesn't mean they can't brute force you remotely, but that gets to be a noisy operation. Okay, and hopefully you'll spot that one coming. Okay. The other one I'm going to try to do here is uh, RPC decon. Okay, a little bit more recent, a little bit uh, less opportunity to modify things. Hey, you see on the left, uh, there's a, I don't know, you know how Microsoft writes their code sometimes, but uh, they have a string buffer, a very small string buffer allocated. It's only like 32 bytes allocated on the stack. 
And that array receives uh, the machine name, the host name, for the host running the service or the host lookup. And ultimately, if you go through the rest of the function, which I don't identify here, but obviously this stuff is public, um, that host name getting copied into that buffer results in the buffer overflow that uh, yields the exploitable condition. Now, in this case, we don't have quite as much ability to change. It, it, they are only using a small amount of stack spaces, the one byte subtraction. You have to be careful. You say, well, you know, so I can track, subtract all the way up to FF. Okay, there's a problem with that when you deal with the offsets because the offsets generated from EBP will also be one byte offsets and they're treated as signed integers. And when you start subtracting uh, EBP minus FF, minus a minus, you're actually moving forward and so you have these signedness issues. So restricted to about the, the, the best we can do is to change this up to about a 7C, I think, is where we start to reach the limits of EBP's ability to reach this variable without running into a, a, a one byte signed issue. Okay. But that simple change, that small change, obviously there's not a lot of randomness left there or available there and, and for, but the attacker and the attacker can certainly brute force you. So, you know, where do you maybe play around with things? You just, you use alternate alignments. Uh, instead of changing this, just following the top, we're going to keep stack pointer aligned on a four byte boundary, but we might adjust string one to start instead of 7C, 7B. So then any alignments, any pointers to things are fall off by four bytes when you pop them into EIP. Okay, because they're trying to get addresses into EIP and they're expecting a particular alignment in this buffer as they overwrite EIP. If you shift it off by one, they don't get quite what they had hoped for. So the, the, you know, just other opportunities. So I'm going to try to wrap this up and we'll see if RPC DCOM is still running on some of these boxes. Okay, and... Let's go back to the unpatched box and try our Metasploit code here. And bam, that was quick. Okay, everybody sees at the bottom I have a, a, a command prompt on the unpatched system. Okay, exit out of there. And I kind of like Metasploit in that respect. They clean up very nicely after themselves. Okay, they leave RPC DCOM up and running, and you can come right back into the system. Okay, that, that's far more food than I possess. Okay, we will give the unpatched system a try. I should uh, I can't promise you DCOM's not already whacked on that box. So it's not a very good demonstration if we don't even know it's running. Hey, what's a quick command line to show that DCOM's running? RPC. Anybody know? Netstat? That, that works. Okay, and what's our favorite port number for RPC DCOM? 440, UDP 445 right there? Okay, TCP 445. Okay, so we'll the, we'll assume that our that DCOM remains up and running. I apologize for not getting that checked out. And we switch to okay. We give it a go. Yep, couldn't mind. Okay, so that simple little fix defeats the, the, the stock Metasploit exploit to get into RPC DCOM. And we hope that the authors of the Metasploit payloads and, and, and exploits are a little bit smarter than the average worm Arthur. Okay, since they're probably cutting and pasting that stuff anyway, they're right out of Metasploit. So we go back to the box and give it a go. And I think, well, it's still shown as running. Yeah, I think it's probably been whacked okay I'm not sure we can connect to it anymore but uh, that's the basic idea okay, and I think that about well I'm at 10 minutes and that's probably gonna roll into questions again it's like silly 
silly hex editor tricks. Okay, something you can do at home. Okay, if you're not a coder, or, you know, you don't have to again uh, inject new code into binary, change the binary, build new DLLs, use Microsoft's hot patching, hot patching compiler techniques, uh, or wait for some third party, so third party necessarily, to offer up a behavioral hot fix. Okay, if you know this is something that you're interested in, works in CTF. Okay, may not migrate to the real world uh, that well. So with that, uh, I thank you for coming, and I'll take any questions that anybody may have. Is somebody standing back here? Yes? What do you think the uh, opportunity is to automate this mutation problem? Um, I think there is uh, there's some possibility. I've, I've tried to, I've pondered that. And uh, the idea is, if, I mean, the problem is, say, you, if you come out and say, hey, here's a mutation, and you make the mutation public, then everybody uses the same mutation and we're right back where we started from. So yeah, you want a way to uh, build like a mutation generator and you generate the mutation so that uh, hopefully it's fairly unique or at least randomized to your circumstances. Uh, and once you, uh, again, some of these patches, these patches are only like four and seven bytes in, in these two cases. Um, and not behavioral, you know, strictly uh, layout wise. So once you understand where the bytes need to go, you can probably specify a range of values and you need to understand the relationships among the values. If I modify this, if I subtract off here, I need to add over here. And I can subtract, here's the range I can subtract off of and once you pick that, then you can probably spit out a mutation automatically, yeah. So there's probably some opportunity, obviously the more you want to do, the more complex it gets. So, yes, Ryan. The, uh, the quality of disassembly you have to do and the level of detail you have to grok the stack layout here to be able to do these patches is just a couple of steps shy of spotting the vulnerability in the first place and probably being able to patch it directly. Is that? Uh... Um, yeah, and, and that's why I don't know where the skill level separates. Um, I think it, I personally think it's easier to look at assembly than to take that extra step and understand the implications of trying to inject new code or, or shift code um, or even then dig into modifying uh, PE headers or, or, or things like that. I think that's, that is a, it's a, it's probably a fine line. I think, uh, again, this is, this is probably a lower technical skill level. Um, and obviously I think, you know, applying uh, the diffs or, or changing bytes in a binary and, and shipping it, you know, say and run this code is, is difficult in either case, but I think you can be more confident that these will work without breaking your code sooner than getting the patch in. Okay. What happens when the vendor issues the official patch? Do you have to go back and revert to what it was before? Or that, I it? suppose that depends on the vendor's uh, patching mechanism. I, I don't know if they verify whether the, the MD5s or whatever on the original, on the DLL that's going to be replaced. Because most, uh, it depends on the patching technique. Mm -hmm. Okay, if if I'm if I'm gonna, if the vendor's going to give you a whole new DLL, okay, then the overwrite will just kill this fix and hope and, and incorporate the vendor fix. If the vendor's going to come into your DLL and do a hot fix over the top of it, then uh, you have issues. You might have to roll this back, and so that they are hot fixing the known quantity that they had back in their development mm -hmm. shops. So, yeah, that's a good question. Okay, thank you. Um, a lot of vendors are moving toward uh, code signing as a means of uh, protecting against uh, rootkits and trojans and that sort of thing. Uh, in that circumstance, it wouldn't be generally possible for a user to modify a binary on their own because they wouldn't be able to get it signed. Uh, are there any uh, dynamic techniques that could potentially be used along these same lines to maybe hot patch something um, th that would, would be able to get around the code signing? Um, I haven't really thought about it. The only thing that comes to mind is uh, you, if you could modify it in memory in place, if the, the code signing, the code check, the signature checks take place when the binary is initially loaded into memory and I don't know that they periodically recheck uh, the integrity of the binary in any way, shape or form. Um, so you, if, if you want to do it in a hot fix way, you'd have to have direct uh, write access to process memory space which is tough on some processors, although if you've seen Joanna's stuff on Vista rootkits, um, th there's some opportunities there, perhaps. Thanks. Okay. 
Any other questions? Okay, I think I'm out of here on time and thanks for coming.